My name is Lisa Schlinka. I know most of you, so this makes it really fun just to get to have a conversation with you today. Um, but in case you don't know me, I do attend the Mission Church. Um, I serve on the advisory board. We have our, one of our co-founders here, Kelly Kopp. Her husband, Dan Kopp, is the lead pastor here. And we've been in this building for on working on our second year. So it's pretty cool. And I'm also really excited to be a part of the sisterhood ministry. So um, just to kind of get us set in the mind frame for where we're going today, I was in the car, I guess it was just yesterday, actually, seems longer ago, and it was a really foggy, heavy day yesterday. I don't know if you noticed that when you were maybe driving, and um, I was talking to God because sometimes those days just make me feel heavy. And so what I try to do is I just start praying. And when you're in your car, you get to pray out loud. And if anyone's next to you, just act like you have a Bluetooth, which I don't, but they don't know that. And so I'm just praying. And I was talking to God, like, why is this so hard? Like, why is this so hard to get this stuff sorted out? Why do we have these days where we're, we're feeling so low? And I felt him say, you say, well, my head knows it, but my heart just isn't there yet. Have you ever said that before? I know it here, but I just don't know it here. And what he said in that moment was like, you have it wrong. Actually, you know it here. You don't know it here. And that might sound completely backwards to you, but in the backdrop of where we're going today, I'm, I'm just going to ask you to tuck that away. And I'll pull it back out, and I think you're going to agree oh my gosh, my, my heart actually is open to all this. There's a, there's a different block that's kind of, I'm running up against. So I thought that was really cool. And um, anyway, we have been talking about identity. Um, it's a, a very multi-layer topic. It can be an intimidating topic to tackle because some of us have baggage with that word. It is a very um, loaded word in our society today because especially for youth, there's all kinds of identity that I didn't even know existed when I was the age of like my girls right here. And so it can be kind of a touchy topic. This isn't going to be your end game with identity, but I certainly hope that we are further down the road than we were when we even first walked in. To give us an, just a really broad definition of it, I would say identity is who I say I am, who I think other people say I am as well. I think they're coupled. And it's kind of from that place that we live our life. And so that's just going to kind of level the playing field for us. Now, as Deb mentioned, on October 5th, we did a teaching called Children of a Promise. And in that teaching, we took a genealogical perspective of identity. So we walked through the bloodlines, the birthrights, and the blessings of Abraham to really help us see that God had been doing something way back then that was going to impact us, that we actually are a new, not just creation, but in the, the Hebrew was goy, was that word. I don't know if you remember it, but we're a new nation of people, and it included us, non-Jews. And so we looked at it from there to more fully grasp that we really are a new creation. Well, today we're going to look at identity in the rearview mirror, so to say. We're going to take a look at our history of mankind, where we were, to help us understand more how we're going to live right now. And so that's where we're going. And here's the why. Because knowing who we are, it really is the platform that we do life from. And we want to do life and life abundant. And so this is why this topic of identity is a really important one. So we're going to start off here with who am I for the believer we, our correct answer is, I am a new creation. We're probably all on the same page with that. I'm a new creation. But here's my question. How can um, this declaration that most of us have been declaring over our lives or over our entire Christian walk move from a declaration, which is good, we need declarations, to transformation, to really solid belief that that's true? And so I want to begin with a question for you. And here's my question. What would you say is the purpose of the cross? Just take a minute to think about it. 
Here are some ideas that I threw up there for you. You might have some of your own. We have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, rescue from hell to undo the works of Satan, free us from the law of sin and death. These are all aspects of the Christ of the cross. And I wouldn't want to say that one trumps the other. I wouldn't want to say that um, there's not even more than those. Um, depending on where we are in our life, I can definitely say the Holy Spirit has had me focusing on certain aspects of the cross. He is the ultimate teacher, and so he highlights things to us. But what I did feel for today, what he was inspiring me with, was this thought. A crucial reason that Christ shed his blood on the cross, suffered an excruciating death, rose from the dead, was not to make bad men good. It was to give dead people life. And so when he was talking to me about this, the question that we all can ponder right now is, have you really ever understood that apart from Christ, you were dead? You are walking dead. I love the way Paul helps us understand this in Romans 5.12. He says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, who was, who? Who's the one man? Adam. Sin came into the world through one man, Adam. It's kind of was Eve, but we'll let him take the fall. <laughs> and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men. All offspring of Adam, which is us, which is us in the natural, death has come to us. It is in us and it has been passed along in the offspring of Adam. So, where does that bring us? Most of us want to partner with Christ. We truly want to be his hands and feet here on earth, just as it is in heaven. But dead people can't be very effective for the kingdom of God. And so we have to stop living like the dead and really believe that our life is now hidden in Christ. Now you might be thinking, hold on, girl. I am a born-again Christian. I have been saved, and I believe you. I am too. <laughs> um, so we have the mindset of um, being born again and salvation, sometimes in an eternal backdrop or in the afterlife. But what I'm talking about is right here, right now. And I am really talking about a mindset. And the mindset of the dead is, is anyone who hasn't come into relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's a mindset that's actually counterproductive to living as a new creation. Okay, You're, it's aligning us with the old order of things, and it's under the law of sin and death. So we're talking about mindset, not salvation. All right, so guess what? We're in good company because we're not the only people that have struggled with this. We find out from Paul that the Galatians the people of Galatia were really struggling with this as well. And so we're going to take a look here at Galatians. Uh, I took pieces of the letter that Paul was writing to them. And we'll start here. It says from Paul, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to another gospel, which is really no gospel at all. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? And we'll continue. After being with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? Now, I don't know about you, but I can relate to every one of those statements from Paul. I feel like that. I feel like I'm running a good race, and then something kind of cuts in on me. So how do we revert to this con condition after salvation, after we know that we've, we've been safe? Well, it happens when we walk by our flesh, when we walk in our own strength. Now, again, I'm not talking about losing salvation, rather a mindset that paves the way for us to slip into the patterns that produce behaviors of the old self. So what do we do when we're acting like the Galatians and we're tossed between two identities? 
All right. Well, Paul tells us in a very simple but profound statement this. And you know this verse. We say it all, all the time. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of the what? It doesn't say renewing of the heart, but the renewing of the mind. Now, this is not a fake it to make it strategy. I think we read over this one and we're like, yeah, you know, okay. Um, it's a discipline. It truly is a discipline. And it's one that if we press into, it's going to yield excellent fruit. But let's be clear about something. I really felt this was important. Renewing the mind is not what makes us a new creation. Jesus accomplished that on the cross with his resurrection. It is a gift offer to us, and we have to choose it, though. But renewing, doing this verse, doesn't now make you a new creation. You already are a new creation. And you really want to make sure you understand that doing this causes us to live as a new creation. So um, here's the truth of the matter. I, I sometimes ask myself this question, and I wonder if you do too. I'll, I'll find myself saying, why am I doing all this? Why am I going to church every Sunday? Why am I reading my Bible? Why am I spending so much time doing this? Have you asked yourself that? And we have our textbook answers, like we know what we're supposed to say. But I don't know that those answers really compel us to even talk about Jesus or to live in a different life. Maybe we can't even imagine what that could look like. And so um, I want to come back to that thought. But as we do, one thing we've been doing in our home is decluttering the basement. And we have a bunch of VHS videos, and we can't play them because we don't have a, a video player. And there are a lot of them from, from my like high school years and college years. And so my hubby, who's technical, he has been... Um, transferring those onto the computer so that we can actually see them, which is awesome. And so he had been working on that one evening, and I came downstairs the next day, opened my computer, and right there in my window, there was a bunch of video clips. And I was like, good morning, video clips, cool. And so I start clicking on them, and I start watching them. So first, right off the bat, my mom had videoed a lot of those. And so if you, if you know me well, you know, my mom passed away about four years ago. It'll be four years in April. And so I am hearing her voice, you know, she's talking to the dog and, you know, my sister and I are dancing in this one and I have really, I had really big hair. Um, it has shrunk as I've gotten older, but um, it was really big and I did try to do that style where you make it even bigger. And um, so it's kind of, ooh, kind of scary to watch as well. But um, there was this one video in particular, and it was a picture of me in college, a video of me in college, and I'm about 19, and I am riding my horse. I had two horses. One was a rodeo horse, and one was a Western Pleasure horse. And this was my rodeo horse, smoking, And I brought them to college with me, and I was on the rodeo team at my See, you learned something about me today at my university, Southwest Texas State University, go Bobcats. And um, I was warming up. And it was just this really sunny, because Texas has sun. And it was really nice and just this nice video, I'm warming up smoking. And then it like switches and I'm in the arena. And all of a sudden you just, you see me coming through. And my mom's she's videoing me. And I can hear her voice. And she says, come on. Let them run. And it's real quiet. And when I heard it, I just had this amazing God moment. Because I felt like, as I watched at my 46-year-old self, 19 in the picture, I could see I was bumping him back. I was holding him back a little bit because I was afraid of his full potential. I was afraid of what he could really do. I have to tell you, smoking was crazy. He was. <laughs> He was a crazy horse. Um, you did not ride him for pleasure. When there's something kind of like this in a rodeo arena, you have the alleyway. The spectator never sees that part. You only see the arena. 
But when he and I would be coming down the alley, he would be side prancing, bucking, rearing. And I mean, I couldn't, we, couldn't, we didn't even run straight. Like we would gallop sideways. And then when we got to the entrance, he would square up and he like, he knew the course, like that boy could do it. And so um, I, I really felt God showing me something with that. And we actually thought it'd be fun to show you a little rodeo clip. Would you like to see one? So this is, this is one, this is, so the girls watched this because I was like, look, look at me, I did something. And um, Shine was like, where's your cowboy hat? What, you're not very dressed up. I'm like, I know, it's, oh, that was Coco? It was a local rodeo. It wasn't like a big, it was just Tuesday night rodeo, okay? I didn't even have to pay to come to these things. But a camera was like, I can't even understand what that man was saying because they're not used to hearing the, the stronger accents was, I don't have a strong accent. But um, all right, let's just, this isn't the one where you're going to hear my mom. You will hear her if you listen. She's come on, if it plays. Ah. Welcome to San Marcos, Texas. Do you hear my mom? Okay, that's it. That's fun. My little moment of glory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I won't be singing on the stage like you, Lisa. But there's my moment of glory. Yeah, so that wasn't the one. The, the one with my mom where you could hear more it was a little bit dark, so I chose that one. Um, but I feel like that's something that Jesus is doing. He's just like my mom. He's cheering us on. He's saying, let me do my thing in you. Would you stop pulling on the reins? Would you let me run my race in you? And it really, really, really spoke to me. So living in the reality of our new identity is going to be key to life and life eternal. And I think having that mind frame is actually going to also show us when we ask those questions like, why am I doing this? Why, why am I? I don't even know what I'm doing this for. I think sometimes we're asking the wrong question. I don't even know if that's the question we should be asking, but maybe what we should ask is, am I living in identity with you right now? Because that question to me points to striving. Why am I doing all this? I'm so tired. What's the point? And if you find yourself doing that, change the question. Am I in identity right now? Am I being? So our anchor verse for for this teaching is right here in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It states this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. When I don't go through the process of transformation, I'm living like the dead. In a nutshell, what was tripping up the Galatians was living between two identities. And this is what we don't want to do. So that brings us to our first point, and it is this. Trust and obey, it's the only way. Now, when I said that, or when you read it, you might have gotten the, I don't like that. I don't like that obey part. Um, and that's okay. It's a word that sometimes we're not comfortable with. I hope um, to put you at ease with that word as we continue today together. And so one way we're going to better unpack this is we're going to go to the rearview mirror. We're going to go back to Genesis right in that garden, right at the beginning, and if you follow along with me while I read, go ahead and, there we go. So we're at Genesis right here. It says, When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. Now I submit to you right here at this point that from the beginning we would be working we would not be working for our survival, however. We would be working rather for purpose, partnership, and for satisfaction. And guess what? I believe, well, this is just my thoughts. I'm not trying to make a theology out of it. When we're in heaven, it's going to be the same thing. We're not going to be floating around, you know, doing nothing. We're going to be working with God. We got the, the, the rain on earth coming up ahead of us. It's going to be for purpose, for partnership, and for satisfaction, so continuing, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. 
Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the, out of the uh, ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, good for food. In the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. We know that. We know that for sure. Okay, a couple things I want to point out before we go further is this. The earth was built for life and to sustain life, but it was not in its mature state. You can see that in our text. No shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth. No plant of the field had yet sprung up. The Lord hadn't sent rain. It also says here that there was no man to work the ground. So while everything was being put in place, it wasn't, it wasn't yet ready to sustain life. But then we see that God created Adam out of the dust, and he puts him in a place that's ready to sustain life, right? And here he's going to have streams for water, and there's fruit-bearing trees. And there's two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we can see right up from the beginning clues about our relationship with God. It was, well, it was a relationship, first of all. And it was one that was going to be progressive. It was one at the beginning that started out slightly immature. We can see how um, it was going to develop. There wasn't going to be striving for survival. Rather, God was going to provide everything that Adam and Eve needed in that garden, and they would be sustained. So let's continue to read in Genesis to see some more interesting details. Genesis 2.17, you may freely, unconditionally, eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day that you eat from it, you shall most certainly die. So two things stand out to me here. They're free to eat from any tree. We're told there are many fruit-bearing trees, but two named trees were centrally located in the middle of the garden. Now, God never warned against eating from the tree of life. The only tree that he gave a warning was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, I like the amplified uh, version of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The amplified Bible says, the tree of experiential knowledge, recognition of the difference between good and evil. This has more to do with discernment, okay? They're not in their mature state yet. Adam and Eve are not. We know up to this point, everything in the garden, everything on earth that God created was good. Had he ever said it was bad? So I had this kind of, oh my gosh, that wasn't a bad tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was not in and of itself bad because nothing that God created was bad. But if they ate from it, there would be bad outcomes. Because just as we saw that the shrubs and the ecological systems of earth were not mature, neither were they. They needed to wait. And maybe God was going to let them eat of it one day. I don't know. Maybe he, they never were. Maybe it was only for the tree of life. I can't say. But he asked them to obey. Now, here's another thing I wanted to point out. Did you ever ask yourself, why did he put those two trees right in the middle? Darn it. Make it harder to get to. It's going to have bad outcomes. Hide them a little bit. Well, some of my thoughts on this are shaped by, um, well, I have to say shaped by our church, by um, Dan, but also shaped by Dr. Tim Mackey. I don't know if you know of the Bible Project. He's the creator of that, and he has an amazing podcast. Also, um, Greg Boyd. Um, so on this one, I got this from Greg Boyd, and I love his stance on this, that if you're going to have a relationship that's built on love and trust, that's a legitimately honoring relationship, you have to allow room for choice. Otherwise, you have orchestrated the situation so that you can predict the outcome, so that no one has to actually choose to love and obey you, but you have now forced it. And so he had to make both trees readily available so that Adam and Eve could choose. And he does that with us all the time, doesn't he? It's all about choice. We get choices. Um, we see this pattern of trust and obey language throughout the Old Testament. 
Um, in fact, when I was little, there was a song I learned, the Trust and Obey song. Did you all learn it? Okay. Oh, well, some of you did. Did you learn it? Trust and Obey, Beth Carter? Because I'm going to sing it, but I sure, I sure want someone else to sing it with me. Yeah, I'm going to start it. <laughs> okay, so I learned this song in Sunday school. And, it, and I remember when I was little, I was like, this, this does not sound like a fun way to be happy. But um, it goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And honestly, it's a song, I'll be at home and I'll start humming it. It's a song when I was little where I was like, that doesn't sound like fun, to now as an adult, I'm like, I like that song and I, I hum it. It's like the Holy Spirit brings it to my mind. So if you had bad feelings about the trust and obey concept, um, I hope you're put at ease. I hope that uh, you see trusting in God is key to living in the truth that we are a new creation, and it'll help us stay in that truth. Our next point is this, you did surely die. Understanding deeply that we were the walking dead apart from Christ will definitely help us from being tossed between two identities. Let's see um, where this death took place. We're gonna again look in the rearview mirror in Genesis, bringing us to that snake. Now the serpent was craftier than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit, excuse me, from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate and she gave some to her husband. So one of the reasons I, I wanted to start here at this point was uh, for this. I draw a lot from my childhood. I remember thinking as a kid, oh, they didn't die. What, what, what was that all about anyway? And here's what I know now. God doesn't lie. But John 8 tells us that Satan is the father of lies. And if he's speaking his native language, it's going to be full of twisting of the truth and lying. And so if God says that there's going to be a death, there's going to be a death. So I believe something that happened here were two things um, first of all, Satan tries to tempt them by saying, by eating of this fruit, they're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, they were already created in God's image, so that was a lie. They weren't going to be any more like God. They already were created in his image. I believe also that Satan tempts us in another way. He tempts us to rush things. God wanted to teach them discernment, and Satan, true to his nature, wanted them to cut corners. He wanted them to snatch power that wasn't theirs to snatch. And I think this is really important for us to recognize because he does it to us too. He wants us to cut corners. He wants us to take what might not be ours to take yet. We need to mature. We need more discernment. We need to wait. We need to trust and obey. So... Um, I, another thing I found super interesting was this. The very thing that God gave Adam and Eve dominion over, which were the creatures of the earth, cultivating the earth, managing it, the very thing that she was supposed to subdue, subdued her. And so when we don't stay in our authoritative role of who we are in our identity, we are more likely to be subdued. Okay? And so... Um, it's just another great example of why this is so important to be solidified in us, which brings us to point number three, the heart, a gateway from death to life. Understanding that we were spiritually dead will make our new life all the sweeter and help us stay on track to living transformed. So at this point, the law of sin and death entered the picture while Adam and Eve did not instantly die, it took 930 years to catch up with Adam, they did spiritually die. They had to leave the, Eden, the Garden of Eden 
this place that God had prepared for them to sustain them as they matured, as they began to cultivate, as they began to multiply. Adam and Eve and all their offspring would now have to live with their spirits, that heart that we talked about at the beginning, in a state of rigor mortis, otherwise known as the hardened heart. No longer would they have abundant food and water. They'd have to toil for their survival. And the very things that their bodies are made to do, if you think about a man being a little bit more muscular in stature than a woman, he doesn't have to now toil. The ground was going to come up against him and not produce. And the woman, her body made to bring life forth, was going to have pain in that process. There's a lot of verses in the Bible that describe the death we're talking about here. I picked out one for sake of time. Ephesians 2.1 sums it up beautifully. It says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. So, One thing that I wanted to point out with the word dead is this. Um, In the Greek, dead is the word nekros. And it means what we think it means. Physically dead, spiritually dead. But what I liked about the definition, the part I wanted to hone in on is this. It means separated from the life-giving grace of God. Or more specifically, having one's soul separated from the enlivening of the divine light and spirit. And we see that over and over through the Old Testament, that they, this darkening that came upon all of mankind, starting with Cain and Abel, starting with what happened there, that was really poor discernment on Cain's part. I think you'd agree. And it just continued and continued. But God's desire has always been to live in relationship with us. He wanted us to be at home in him and reign the earth with him. We see evidence of this in the Garden of Eden. We see in the rescue of the Israelites from Egypt. We see it played out in the prophets, in the judges, in the kings. We see in the law of Moses, God constantly coming after us to bring us back home to him. I love this next verse from Matthew 23, 37. Because although God was willing we were not. Although the beginning with the Israelites, they were so good at outwardly walking through the rituals that needed to happen, but inwardly their hearts remained as hard as stone. And we have here Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. But God was willing. And the great physician accomplished it through, through the cross, through his death, through his resurrection for us. So our anchor verse of today's teaching is found here in 2 Corinthians 5.17. And I chose the Passion Translation because I love the way that it is worded. It is so specific. There we go. It says this, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ... He has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. So why is our identity so important to examine? Well, I think most of us want to do more than die and have pie in the sky with Jesus one day. Our north on the kingdom compass is this. It's the Great Commission. It's heal the sick. Raise the dead, cast out demons, share the good news of God's kingdom throughout the earth. And I hope that by pressing into the trust and obey relationship mankind has with God, by understanding the death that took place in the Garden of Eden, and then believing that you have been made new, that we will be more able to fully walk in the reality that we are a new creation. So when I came to an end of writing this, I was like quite relieved because as Deb said, I'll write and then I'll kind of talk to God about it. And then he's like, no, we're going to go over here a little bit more. And so it takes some time. And so I sat on the couch and I was like, phew, God, we did it. And so I just wanted to pray a little bit. 
And so I was just quiet on my couch, and I was praying to God, and I was thinking it was going to be this prayer about Thanksgiving, like, thank you so much, you know, we did it. And as I'm praying, I just have my eyes closed, and I just start feeling like seeing these things about my nature that I did not like. They weren't specific behaviors. I'm not talking about behavior modification. I'm talking about things that the Holy Spirit was showing me, bringing something to the surface in me. And honestly, I just, I started crying. I was truly remorseful. And I don't know that I've ever, not in a long time, have I cried over sin in that same way. And I had my eyes closed and I was crying and just picturing in my mind the cross of Christ with him on it. And I had my eyes closed and I can just see his body up on the cross. And what stood out to me is that his whole body took up the whole wooden cross. I I could barely even see the cross on it. And as I traveled up his body and I saw his face, he looked at me. And he just said, put it on me. And I felt terrible because he's, he's like overwhelmed by hell on the cross. And I realized I'm not going to be able to stick it on the wood. Like I have to stick it on him. And he was telling me, put it on me. It's one thing to stick it on a piece of wood in our mind. It's another thing to add to the destruction that his body had already taken. And it was a really powerful moment for me. It felt good. And so we thought it would be really nice at the end of this portion of, of our morning. If you feel safe enough, if you'll enter into it, you'll notice in your, your handout that there is a, she's doodled all over hers. Here. She's in, you're having a quiz leader on this. There's a sticky note. And we're going to have some music playing in just a minute. You don't have to rush right yet. But the idea is that you would just see what the Holy Spirit brings to your mind. And it, it doesn't have to be like some specific sin. I don't know what it's going to be. He'll, he'll meet you. And maybe it's even just a, a symbol of something you draw that means something to you or a date. I, I don't know what it is. Color red. It's between you and, like, maybe he knows what that means and you know what it means. But I would write it on the sticky side because what we'd like for you to do is when you're ready, just come up and, you know, it's just a figurative activity to hopefully make a real literal change in us to stick it on the cross. Don't put your name on it. Just stick it on there and then come back to your seat. We'll probably have like six to seven minutes to do this activity so you can take a minute to reflect. Um, no one's going to read these. I promise you, I will, specific, I will myself rip them off, and I'm going to take them straight to the bin. We, no, we don't want to see your stuff. We have our own stuff. So I hope you'll feel safe, and I hope you'll believe me that um, it will be very confidential. And again, you can write it in code if you want. So um, we're going to start some music. I'm going to do it too.